Dear everyone, welcome. Uh, we are starting this season with a discussion on the platform of the Urban Coalition Rosquip. Uh, we would like to start with a short technical issue. For you to take part in our discussion and to follow it in Ukrainian, please choose the Ukrainian channel. Today we have simultaneous translation. Uh, to choose Ukrainian, uh, on your screen below, choose interpretation button and the Ukrainian language there. Two languages uh, and synchronous uh, translation. So, if you would like, uh, if you would like to have uh, uh, translation and uh, to listen and take a part uh, in today's discussion in English, please use the uh, inter uh, interpretation button on the below panel of the Zoom and uh, use the English channel. Also, today we have a discussion. That is why we would be really glad to see your questions and comments. Please uh, free, feel free to uh, put them during our discussion. And also after the key presentations from our speakers, we will have an opportunity to come back to your questions. Uh, you can either uh, choose the reaction options uh, to uh, voice your questions live or write them in the Q&A and chat options. Today we are here um, to talk about the new draft law uh, 9664, its potential threats and alternatives. And uh, we have our guest speakers today, uh, namely Hanna Bonder, Member of Parliament, uh, Yulia Klimenko, Member of Parliament, and um, First Deputy Chairman of the Committee on, for Transport and Infrastructure, Irina Federiv, journalist, activist, leader of NGO uh, Halka, uh, Nathan Hudson, Professor for Urban Planning and um, Vahn um, Natsakanyan, certified engineer in the field of energy and PhD in environmental safety. And this is the team uh, today to discuss the draft law. I will be your moderator today, Margot Didichenko and Lilith Bradles. Today, together, we will present a Rosquit Urban Coalition for Ukraine. And Lilith, you have the floor to uh, introduce this discussion, why it is so urgent. Thank you, Margo, and also welcome all of you uh, uh, on behalf of me. I am extremely glad that you can all make it uh, for this uh, important and, and first discussion in 2024. Of course, I wish everyone uh, a good year, and we all know what it means in this context, uh, the context that it's a good year. Um, it is a very important discussion, I think, because uh, in general, within the discussions and the lectures in, in Roskvit, uh, we pay a lot of attention to law and regulation, and that is because uh, it's it's a kind of basic. So urbanists and architects are normally not taking that much into account that they have a kind of agency there. But in the framework of post-war reconstruction, it becomes even more important than normally. Um, if reconstruction is being done, and we see that in, in many other examples and many other cases, is from the very start, the regulations and the law are not good, are not, um, yeah, let's say fair, maybe. Uh, a lot of problems happen afterwards, and everything traces back. If you look after 30 years of, of things happening, for instance, in, in Lebanon, or for instance, in uh, Kosovo, and you see afterwards tracing back like, but what was the real reason why things went wrong, then it was not because there was an architect messing up a building, because that's not so important, but it was because lawmakers were messing up, or uh, maybe 
all professionals around it, urbanists and architects, didn't pay attention or planners. I mean, they can help actually lawmakers in creating laws that also will live up to the expectations in the longer run and not just in the short run. Uh, we with uh, Roswit had had earlier a uh, discussion when the law uh, 565 was uh, 5655 was on and uh, yeah I, I think it was a very important discussion to to bring it into the public attention. Uh, today's uh, discussion will be around another one, uh, as, as Marco already explained, which is the 9664 law. And that one is dealing with water and waterways and construction uh, on areas where waterways are, uh, are present. So it is a very broad law. It's not just concerning port or port authorities, but it goes much wider than that. And that means that it can have a lot of influence. Um, so we were hoping to have in this discussion some kind of input and background on other examples where um, laws on uh, ports and port authorities are being uh, taken into place. That's why we invited uh, Nathan and, and Van to get it into a perspective which is a little bit broader on both on the economical field and on the, um, the area of, of ecology, which is a very important uh, aspect to, to look into in this case. Uh, and we invited uh, two members of parliament who are very much into the law and, and understand it very well and are concerned about some of the issues that, that are being uh, raised now. So we hope uh, with the discussion and input from basically looking at it from different sides, because of course uh, we do realize that a port is extremely important in terms of also economy and um, how to reconstruct the, the, the country afterwards, the port plays an enormous important role. So it, it is not just a, a small thing. Um, we like to kick off with uh, an, an explanation basically of what the law entails, because it's like, uh, the problem with laws is, is the amount of pages and the amount of uh, language also often used, which makes it not so accessible to, to a broader audience and therefore also makes it very difficult for other kind of professionals who are not completely into it to understand it and to, to connect to it and to even understand what is being said there and what is being done and the consequences come only later. So uh, for this extremely difficult task uh, to kind of summarize the the, the hundreds of pages, uh, we asked Irina Vedorif, um, who, who has been digging into this law and has been writing also a lot about it already. Um, so please, maybe you could kick off and, and start with explaining a little bit what the law is about and, and what some major uh, issues or concerns or, or points of attention you would like to highlight. Thank you very much for having me and I would like to stress today that in Ukraine today we understand the support uh, of our Western partners uh, provided to Ukraine uh, at this moment and uh, the resources we're getting uh, depend upon trust. So our civil society, uh, members of parliament uh, need to uh, lobby for the legislature which will not contradict western values we will do everything possible to uh, resurrect rebuild uh, everything that was destroyed and to continue after the war uh, yes we have analyzed this uh, draft law uh, in various aspects uh, we have engaged ecologists uh, uh, legislators and other specialists. And now I would like to share my presentation summarizing our conclusions. Here, one of the key initiators uh, of the draft law, uh, Olena Shulak, um, head of the uh, uh, ruling party, Sluha Narodu, 
uh, servant of the people. And uh, this is an initiative that was uh, drafted together with the government. And this is the initiative aimed at resolving issues with the ports of Ukraine. Ports are extremely important because we need to use them to uh, transit uh, grain and our economy uh, de depends upon this. But let us really discuss uh, whether the publicly voiced uh, provisions of this uh, draft law are really the way they sound. So the challenges that we have been pointed at the very start, we need to have not only uh, the, uh, we need to stick to the procedure uh, to make it efficient. When we are talking about ports and logistics, the, the first issue for us is, is what committee must uh, discuss it. And so somehow this uh, clearly transportational uh, project draft law is being discussed not by the transportation um, committee, but by a committee on organization of state power, local self-government, uh, regional development and urban planning. And in my opinion, this is a real violation. So uh, ecological committee um, uh, didn't quite approve of this uh, project ecologically, we understand because it is really very I have uh, discussed the procedure in terms of uh, Great Britain and its context, and uh, there is a practice to involve courts there. So, and in the uh, practice of our Supreme Court, uh, we can see that uh, it is being dominated by the decisions uh, to return the land that was allotted with violations to uh, to return it to the Hromada or to the state. And together with uh, lawyers, we have analyzed this practice. And we understand that the draft law can really endanger this practice. Instead of borrowing uh, the best court practices from Europe, we are actually blocking this initiative if we adopt this draft law. And the fourth point here, which was a problem from this very start, before even the first reading, this uh, draft law was not uh, analyzed from the point of view of corruption and uh, corruption opportunities. I have uh, provided the links to the articles which discuss these um, facts in more um, detail. And unfortunately, I have just 10 minutes to present you the material. So uh, what kind of risks are we running here for um, such areas? Um, the uh, areas next to rivers, lakes, and other water resources are in danger because our draft law which is being positioned as uh, a resolution for seaports actually from the very outset focuses on uh, rivers, lakes and water reservoirs. And at once here we are dealing with the interest of developers. Uh, the same that goes in 5655 five, five draft law and so uh, we have analyzed together with lawyers and my um, sources uh, this um, draft law and they understand that uh, to um, formalize uh, and shape the uh, land plots if there it is a possibility that uh, some land would be reclaimed from the water resources and so uh, this of course, uh, is deplorable practice. And another point here is uh, the role of local self-governance will be diminished. And um, so 
the investors and developments could uh, act very not transparently and they will have quite a lot of license to manage the lands up to actually uh, infringing the territory of the region which is not uh, officially under their management so here i'm showing you this slide from the ministry of uh, ecology which uh, voiced its a very negative position which uh, um, summarizes the conclusion as as the draft law will uh, provide for uh, development in uh, on the banks of the rivers and other water resources uh, which is deplorable. And here you see um, that people are criticizing us also. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, we are being very uh, seriously supported. Here you can see um, the fragment of the article and he uh, commends us for, uh, for standing for uh, water resources being uh, kept for public use. And one more interesting thing to discuss it, it's about corruption. And I'm here actually questioning uh, the silence of this committee, anti-corruption committee. Uh, when they were discussing 5655, they, um, they were rather eloquent, but here, um, well, after 5655 was adopted, we have, we have been for one year uh, proving everyone that, yes, it was a bad uh, thing to adopt. But now to return back to uh, Ms. Shulak, when during our first session I heard this project, this draft law being discussed, even the uh, committee members were... Uh, um, asking why there was no appeals to the committee for anti uh, anti corruption anti corruption committee, and what we received was the answer that the national anti corruption uh, agency was do was monitoring the um, draft law. Yes, this is the procedure. If uh, the national agency finds it that necessary, then the expertise would be. Uh, appointed and started, but presently we cannot see any uh, anti-corruption expertise conclusion provided by the uh, agency, anti-corruption agency. Uh, we have analyzed the draft law not only from the point of view of its threats to ecology of Ukraine, but also from the points of view of corruption. Uh, there is also a on an article we have published today, actually, and our question there is very simple. The anti-corruption agency has uh, voiced its uh, conclusions about this draft law. Uh, actually, when you look uh, at these con conclusions, uh, the anti-corruption expertise had to be conducted, but it wasn't. And so here, this... Uh, draft law will actually be um, uh, promoted though there is no uh, electronic rosters for the objects uh, that it concerns and so we are dealing with lack of information another thing is easement and if you have um, uh, if you have to look at this issue the easement is in the uh, water area while the rent the land lease without any uh, competition is uh, allowed on land on the territory of the port so the situation could be that when we have no competition and the project is being adopted uh, then well, what we get, uh, the way uh, to the water area could be blocked. And so when there is no competition, this is a step back clearly. And I don't understand either why we don't have any public hearing of this uh, draft law, because what we have here, 
is the situation of 5655 draft law, or, which was kept secret from the community. I have also um, mentioned the practice of the Supreme Court here, and the risk here is that we are dragging this draft law to its first reading without anti-corruption expertise. After our discussion, after um, our reaction, uh, the members of parliament have uh, paid attention to self-governance risks and ecology risks. And there were proposals from two MPs to use um, Article uh, 106 of our procedure um, to um, disregard those risks in terms of rivers and uh, focus those risks on the part of self-government. Looks right because it looks like the committee listened to us, but I'm living during the time when I can analyze information and I can say I, I am not buying that because if we see that this project had to be worked on uh, by the Committee of Transport, but uh, it found itself in the Committee on Organization of State Power under Ms. Shulak. And I'm not sure that this is the case. Uh, this is the case when uh, this story with 106 of the procedure will be successfully implemented. Here, um, what to do is the question. My answer would be, um, champion uh, taking this draft law back to the committee and um, the procedure, the normal procedure would be um, to create a work group before all those erroneous decisions were taken on this draft law. And I guess we must involve all the stakeholders, uh, public representatives, ecologists, representatives of ports and business and public participation is necessary we are going to discuss it and only then uh, the project will be ready the draft law will be ready for the first reading so uh, if i can um well i think i will finish here thank you very much and i'm looking forward to your questions after uh, the rest of the speakers have had their say Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's indeed uh, first continue and, and afterwards uh, start the questions and, and discussion to all of us. Then we have this overview. Uh, Nathan Hudson is our next speaker uh, who will share something, as I said before, from, from a more international context. Uh, we can see your share now very nicely. So Nathan, please take the floor. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll try to go um, quickly to give more time to our honored guests from the Ukrainian parliament. I'd like to uh, discuss uh, the international context of law 9644 and why it's so important. The first point is that port ownership and issues related to ports are always fraught with uh, politics. We've seen many uh, international examples for example, in the United States, the Dubai Ports World controversy of 2006, which caused a major uh, political scandal in the United States. There's been a lot of global um, uh, discussions about Chinese acquisitions and other foreign acquisitions of critical port assets, critical port lands, particularly those related to China's Belt and Road initiatives. Uh, and uh, fear that this acquisition of key port assets will undermine both national sovereignty and development goals in developing countries. So this is not just an issue in Ukraine, it's happening all around the world. Um, when we talk about ports, one of the key questions is how do we balance the profit seeking with private entities and environmental protection? And in several countries, United States included, you have uh, a larger entity like the uh, Army Corps of Engineers in the case of the United States that's responsible for maintaining river navigation and deep water channel access and is responsible for weighting the benefits and costs 
of different types of improvements and different development alternatives. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was one of the first entities in the world to uh, pioneer the process of benefit cost analysis. And in recent years, environmental impacts have been increasingly considered throughout this procedure. However, um, you still have a situation in which the organization is accused sometimes of publicly subsidizing polluting industries, uh, petrochemical industry, uh, and discounting or not uh, fully appreciating the impact of uh, navigation uh, improvements on wetland loss, fish migration, and other uh, environmental externalities. So as an example, this is showing the, uh, the river system that's currently managed in the United States by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And you can see that they, they manage it as a system, uh, the understanding that it must operate as a system, both from the perspective of its economy and for ecological reasons, and it prevents um, those areas that are upriver from taking actions that might negatively uh, impact areas that are downriver. So again, that's a it's a rationale for having a single entity that could potentially regulate these riverine systems. The question should port land use decisions be made nationally or locally? Uh, for economic reasons, there's a strong argument uh, that a country should have a national port plan, should have a national port vision, and should have strong international coordination at the same time. Uh, ports and rivers must function as a network because they must interline with other freight networks, whether those are rail networks or highway networks that are also national or international in scope. Uh, furthermore, a river should be seen as a coherent ecological system. You have to manage a river as one single entity. On the other hand, you have local areas who have specific interests and invariably bear the ecological costs when there are port improvements. Uh, and sometimes these local areas or local jurisdictions don't realize uh, the benefits of these improvements. So in an extreme example, you've seen situations in the Three Gorges Dam, for example, where entire cities have been flooded uh, in the name of economic development. So local areas often bear the cost. When we look at port ownership patterns in the United States and in Europe, uh, most port authorities in the United States are what we call landlord ports in that they own the land, but they lease out their operations to private sector entities, private providers with particular capital uh, uh, and expertise. Um, in Europe, you see central governments or municipal governments uh, controlling uh, ports. And also in Europe, you see a lot of concerns growing about uh, foreign uh, ownership, about Chinese uh, ownership uh, in, uh, in st growing stake in European seaports. So this is a, an overview from a recent report that shows how European port authorities and port land is controlled uh, in the European context. And here you can see state and regional uh, control being the dominant uh, uh, strategy for port um, ownership. So th what are the implications for this for Ukraine? Uh, ports, as Lilith mentioned earlier, are going to be absolutely essential for Ukraine's rapid reconstruction and its future economic dynamism. It's not only the fact that Ukraine doesn't have sufficient port capacity, it also doesn't necessarily have the right type of port capacity and that its port capacity is set up primarily for the movement of low value bulk uh, goods, uh, does, not, does not have very much container capacity, and this container growth will require incredible capital investment and it will also require coordination with European and Black Sea uh, partners. But while efficiency in doing this is, is vital. If a law passes that leads to the lack of trust, the loss of trust in the investment priorities, this could lead to a backlash by the public, and that could raise the investment risk for any private sector party that would want to invest in the Ukrainian port system going forward.
So we have to strike a balance between the need for efficiency and the need to move quickly and the need to have a continuity of trust that will allow those investments to be made in a strategic manner. So with that, I will um, stop my share and I will pass it uh, on to Vagan for the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. This was very informative for us to understand how um, international practice works and uh, what aspects are worthwhile to pay attention to. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Um, Natsa Kanyan, um, certified engineer. Uh, please um, tell us about the ecological risks that the draft law entails. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. Welcome everyone, dear colleagues. Thank you for inviting me. I would like to use very simple language to discuss the risks uh, that emerge uh, here in connection to this draft law. But First, I would like to discuss it on one example, and the case is the case of Mariupol. This is one of the um, most up, well, state of the art uh, uh, keys, uh, 15 and 16, and since 2014 till 2020, Mariupol was developing its port facilities very actively. They were reconstructing what they had and building new keys. And um, there was a very keen understanding of the strategic importance of this object, uh, both on the part of the local authorities and uh, the national authorities and the investors and the port board of directors. And I understand that if there is the political will, if there is the understanding of how to invest and where it is possible to get a good functioning facility. And of course, uh, only legislative acts will not be, will not suffice to develop ports, but they are very conducive to their development. So uh, that is why uh, the draft law is very important. We need to take this into account here. First of all, I would like to say that unfortunately not everyone understands that water is our most important strategic resource. Um, my own experience shows that um, a person who survived the hellish Mariupol of 2022 understands and appreciates that water is our key strategic resource. Unfortunately, when we have a look at the map of water resources of Ukraine, we can see that, yes, we do have quite a lot of water resources, but two weeks ago, I think I saw um, publications from the uh, Water Resources Agency on um, master planning the water resources of Ukraine. It was a big work and it was very professional and I got some very interesting data from it about pollution of our water resources and water objects. Right now, uh, it poses a huge risk and must be tackled at the national level, primarily but not only, but the draft law we're discussing today, 9664, presents us with a situation that all the uh, territories that are um, to be developed according it will actually open the Pandora box 
because uh, it means land reclamation. It means creation of new land. It means uh, dumping earth and even the um, practice, the uh, commercial navigation um, will be stalled. And in my opinion, um, this gives birth to a quite a chaotic situation when our ecological activity in Ukraine is uh, affected very gravely, not only by the acts of war, by the act of terror, which destroyed the Kahovska reservoir, but also we are threatened by the real possible development. Uh, here you can see on this slide the natural parks and uh, uh, natural preserves, and you can see that all of them are linked to water resources and water objects. And I can see that uh, the draft law is a huge risk to all these nature preserves. Yet there is a different kind of experience presented by Europe. Um, Amsterdam, Venice, we have lots of development along the rivers at the same time, dealing with this historic fact, uh, the countries uh, has certain expertise which works. I would give you a, a, sh a short example here. Just two uh, weeks ago, this is the Rain River, the Netherlands. Uh, the water level uh, has risen three meters. At the same time, because of the engineering solutions, clear understanding of the risks, the work of both local and national services and agencies, yes, we can see certain territories are flooded, but there is no panic. All the constructions are, protective constructions are working, and the dwellers are not discomforted the only discomfort maybe is that you need to make a detour on your bike like 500 meters but do we have similar institutions and agencies in ukraine unfortunately i have to state i have never heard of any such agencies and when we were discussing the reconstruction of mariupol embankment uh, we were looking for organizations to um, reverse certain waterways um, uh, during the construction, we found no expertise adequate in Ukraine. And we understand that such development that is fostered by draft law 9664 will be chaotic. And it could be like this. We understand what is the result, right? We have seen such examples in certain regions of Ukraine where uh, such private development will block the way to the water. And this leads to anarchy from the point of view of um, ecological inspection, because today ecological inspection uh, has a lot of questions unresolved and when the draft law, if the draft law is uh, approved, then these questions will be even more numerous. We also, of course, have cases of, this is the legendary Azov Stal. Unfortunately, this is the case when uh, which shows that industrialization could be really pernicious for ecolo ecology. We still have examples of such enterprises, and we understand what such examples lead to. We must appreciate these risks, assess them, and create agencies to forecast such risks and 
design appropriate engineering infrastructure when we are discussing um, draft law 9664 and if we are ready to open this Pandora box and uh, shift the responsibility on to the local administrations, I think we are blocking the investment and we are blocking the economic development of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think this uh, gave, gave a very nice uh, overview of, of some of the potential risk. It, it was uh, short uh, from, from all speakers, but it, it already raised many elements, uh, ecology, economy, uh, social issues to, to take care of. I, I think um, what we hope from from our discussion, and I hope our, our audience can help as well. I'm pretty sure there are people with a, with a lot of knowledge uh, also uh, with us uh, can help to to come up with ideas on actually what to do with this discussion and how to bring it a step further so that it doesn't stay just with us on the screen uh, uh, outing some concerns but indeed uh, a, a suggestion that was already made by by irina which was a first uh, suggestion to think about uh, making a broader committee uh, in, in which all the different stakeholders come together as a work group and, and discuss these kind of issues uh, could be very valuable. So maybe there are other ideas, maybe there are other suggestions on how to create this position. And also uh, we have two members of parliaments here who raised already some of, of their concerns. Uh, and, and I think it would be also interesting to hear from them uh, how basically we can help uh, them in, in raising their voice and, and uh, uh, getting more attention to, to these kind of issues. So I, I like to first give the floor to Hannah Bondar uh, to add uh, her insights to uh, what came up so far and, and what you are thinking are the main issues to, to be discussed uh, today. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to uh, discuss uh, this issue from the point of view of uh, the uh, head of the committee uh, who has been discussing this draft law. And yes, uh, it clearly uh, outstrips our authority, I guess, because uh, here we have so many issues uh, concerning land legislation, uh, water code and other codes. What I have seen um, in this draft law is that uh, it deals with uh, redistribution of authority. Uh, practically, uh, we are centralizing uh, now all the Portland and all the uh, decisions. The role uh, of locals and governors here will be changed. They will not be able to influence the decisions and uh, the development uh, and construction in ports uh, in terms of regulations and restrictions. So on the one part, this draft law uh, pre well pretends to be very e uh, integral, comprehensive. On the other hand, that's not quite the situation. We have received quite a lot of uh, reactions from the Ministry of Ecology, e uh, Economy, uh, uh, and uh, self-governance associations, and association of ports of Ukraine, and two uh, committees, uh, Committee for Transportation and Committee for Ecology. But uh, all these stakeholders are rather apprehensive about this draft law. The only party that is happy with it. This is Ministry for Infrastructure. And uh, this is a very common situation. Uh, so, um, but yet, uh, usually after, after the first reading, usually we have uh, the majority who is approving of some draft law. And uh, so it will pass the first reading easily. But this is the opposite situation. 
And uh, here, Yulia Klimenko has already um, suggested uh, a work group before this uh, project, this draft law, can uh, be can 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 be taken to the first reading. Um, this we are not sure that this first reading will be passed yet. Uh, we are going to monitor the situation. As an architect, I would like to voice my professional opinion here. I am concerned with the process of port planning. Presently, we have the notion of detailed territorial plan or uh, urban planning documentation. Uh, this should also be the estimate and uh, it balances the functions, logis logistics and other things uh, before um, uh, individual projects are designed. But this draft law actually takes uh, shapes the context in a different way and um, so uh, it puts it in the context of port planning. I was googling uh, and I found the plan of port development only for Mykolaiv and it looks not like the uh, urban planning documentation, it looks like a textual document and there is also an aerial view which which, which pinpoints some objects. So this is not exactly the estimate. This is not exactly the plan uh, we are used to. And it is unclear how uh, ports are going to, to be planned and developed, and it should really lead to some chaotic development, and uh, which is absolutely prohibitive for a port because it reduces its efficiency. And I believe that here we have a very difficult question. What should be the general approach towards port planning? So I have my own opinion here, and I stick to it, that we must have a work group created before the first reading. And uh, maybe uh, it should be discussed once again. And I uh, really, uh, would like to express my gratitude to uh, Nathan Hudson, who today told us that uh, the ports in the uh, US are actually managed by US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, because we are now in a state of war. And I absolutely agree that we must also involve the customs, uh, the army, and the bodyguards. So, uh, and unless we have a consensus, we at least need to strive towards it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bonder. You have touched upon the urban planning aspects, which we haven't yet discussed today, but this draft law really uh, is all about urban planning too, right? So, but I would like also to invite uh, Ms. Um, Yulia Klimenko, um, and the, who represents the Committee for Transportation, who believes that this uh, draft law is important. And can you please pinpoint any positive aspects the draft law suggests? Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for giving me the floor, really. Uh, besides being the first deputy chairman for uh, the Committee uh, for Transportation and Infrastructure, I'm also uh, um, an expert on uh, sea safety and um, logistics. So I am dealing with port issues for quite a lot of years and I have a lot to say on this uh, issue, um, maybe later during our discussion. But I would like to start with the fact that uh, the sea and ports are not just infrastructure, are not just transportation, for Ukraine, if you have a look at its uh, economy, um, they mean 70% of export taken through the seaports, which is the cheapest way to export our goods, 70% of grain, metal, and uh, all other articles are shipped through ports. 70% of export gives 60% of uh, currency, foreign currency revenues. So it means ports are extremely important for our economy. 
And today, during the war, we have realized the importance, the importance of the sea and uh, sea shipments being the basis for our economy. And we understand that there would be no rapid uh, redevelopment of Ukraine unless we develop the sea shipment. Uh, because the seas are not only ecology, economy, it's also tourism, fishing. And unless we balance all the aspects, you, we will not get one uh, picture. We will not be a sea country, a sea state. We will be a seaside state. So uh, we are uh, feeding uh, 400 million of people in Asia and Africa uh, with our grain. And this grain is taken through our ports. Now this 400 million are partially hungry due to our stalled marine export. And this was my introduction, and I would like to discuss now the draft law itself. Why it was developed? Uh, it was developed by the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure, which is now doing not only infrastructure, but also uh, communities, and it has become a, a, a logistic monster, monster. And it means that it does too many things, and that is why maybe the outcome is unbalanced. So the initiative of this draft law uh, is long-standing. Uh, it has been discussed for five years in our sector. It is nothing new, but this initiative was discussed only uh, as applied to ports. So it was not discussed within the context uh, that is presented by draft law 9664, uh, because the draft law actually is a toxic mix of uh, various sectors, ecology, local self-governance, um, decentralization. Uh, so Hromadas are, are being deprived of their authority, actually. Um, they have no say anymore in adopting the decisions. So practically, they are given orders from the ministry of you uh, of the cabinet of ministry of ukraine uh, like well yokromada will now have a port uh stevedoring shipping coal for instance so this is absurd and uh, these uh, are the things that make this draft law toxic this is not a draft law about sea about ports it's only 30 percent of its law uh, of this law is about sea and port the rest, 70%, is about all sorts of other water objects, rivers, streams, uh, bays, um, lakes, and it restricts the authority of communities. It actually violates the constitution uh, about the limits of uh, regions, and it affects ecology very seriously. And in general, ecologic regulation is overlooked uh, during the development suggested in this draft law. It distorts and warps um, urban planning, uh, documentation for poor development. So the goal of this draft law uh, is not congruent with the needs of the C sector. The C sector needs a different uh, draft law. That is why I have submitted an alternative draft law uh, which regulates exclusively uh, the development, um, um, construction on lands occupied uh, by ports, seaports, and it does not concern any other uh, water objects of Ukraine. We must understand that sea objects and in general sea logistics and sea uh, safety is being regulated by the international law, 70% of it at least. So we do not need to invent anything again. Uh, uh, we must take the international law, adjust it to our national legislation, and this is our commitment to the world community, to Europe, to the world ocean. And if this law um, focuses on seaports and their development, then yes, it can be 
uh, refined, finalized, and then it would be useful if this law is discussed by uh, its committee, Committee on Organization of State Power, Local Self-Government, etc. If th this committee decides to submit it for voting, then the only way for us to finalize, to make this toxic law better, return it back to the committee, create a work group, and this work group must include uh, various experts from various sectors, because water is the crossroads for tourism, for communities, for ecologists, for business, for logistics, and for safety and security and many other things. And this work group must be very powerful uh, to read uh, and appreciate every letter of this uh, draft law. And the work group must take out the toxic regulations out of this draft law because uh, it opens the uh, Seagate, the Margate of Ukraine to all the um, investors and uh, businessmen with bad reputation. So I'm supporting my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Bonder. I'm supporting my uh, colleagues who have spoken today before me. Uh, we must stop this draft law because um, the Russia's contingency plan, which is always there, is to cut Ukraine from the sea, to keep to, to have it without, uh, to deprive it of economic resources and make it capitulate. Putin will never um, conceal this plan. It is there and uh, have a look. In 2022, when the full-scale invasion uh, started, the only strategic document uh, approved by Putin was the uh, sea strategy, marine strategy of Russia. And uh, you can see a lot of interesting things there concerning force, development, and things. So I implore my colleagues, deputies, please do not approve this law. Finalize it to be profitable for Ukraine. Eliminate the problems. Thank you. I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Klemenko, for your statement and commentary. I would like to start our discussion then and uh, invite everyone to participate. We have already uh, got a few questions in Q&A. You're welcome also to use your reactions hands um, to take the floor. Uh, and you can use both languages, English and Ukrainian. I would like to start with the issue which was already voiced by Ms. Klimenko. This law is multi-layered actually and there are very many stakeholders to this law i would like to start with the question what should be the balance of stakeholders balance of power among the decision makers when we're discussing the development of ports and marine territories should this be the uh, council of the port should it be the national level the local level Mr. Hudson, maybe you can start sharing the experience of the international community in terms of who are the decision makers, um, how to deal with this issue, and maybe we can apply this experience to Ukrainian legislation to balance economics with ecology and spatial development, and at the same time uh, uh, make it legitimate so that it would be well balanced. Did you want me to go first, Margot? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> so in terms of balance, um, yes, having the Army Corps definitely, I think, is good for making things public. It's because everything that they're doing is, is in the public record, and their methodology is relatively simple. But they are criticized because their principal function has been ensuring navigation, and sometimes that's at all costs. 
And so there, there has been criticism that even though they, they, they intend to balance the ecological and the, and the commercial, the commercial tends to win out. And so that, that is a challenge. Um, and again, it's the, the difference between uh, local control. Uh, often what we see, we see very similar images to what Vaughn showed in terms of uh, recreational developments encroaching upon waterways in the United States. For example, the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway has a lot of uh, recreational developments that have sprung up, and sometimes they're technically on paper illegal, but those laws are not enforced. And so there have been a lot of dangerous situations with barges, for example, ca carrying hazardous material, crashing into uh, restaurants that are built uh, into the waterways. And so this is not just a situation that occurs in Ukraine, it occurs in the United States uh, as, as well. And sometimes it's not just about having the laws in the book, it's also about enforcement because often um, entities, private entities will um, not ask for, for permission, they'll just ask for forgiveness. They'll build something and then they'll be tied up in court for many years trying to get it removed. And so this is an issue that we see quite often in the United States, particularly in those areas of the waterways that are relatively lightly regulated because they're between cities. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Maybe uh, Ms. Klimenko, uh, Ms. Bonder could uh, make a comment, how could legislators um, provide for this balance of power uh, in decision-making? Because we're discussing uh, territorial development, uh, which um, should be the province for local communities, but the port stands outside their license, their mandate. So how can we do it? I think uh, I will start, Ms. Klemenko, as the member of the uh, line committee, if we do not um, do not ruin this balance, it's already there. Uh, the plan for port development is now being developed by the uh, Seaports Administration, and then uh, the Cabinet of Ministers adopted. And uh, Cabinet of Ministers is a comprehensive body with balanced interests because we have the Minister of Economy, Minister for Ecology, etc. After the uh, Seaport development plan is designed, then all the um, other ways like railroad, uh, other roads um, must be approved by the local um, government because uh, they are the owners of this territory. They must give their approval. Uh, also, this uh, must be approved by ecologists because we also have security service here. We have border guards because a port is a very comprehensive object and everyone must approve for better or worse. Um, and one like an element like passport control or customs control or absence of CISPO uh, or absence of uh, railway uh, will um, stall the, this port development. And this is what we're experiencing now in Ukrainian ports there is no one window situation uh, because uh, when a, a, a ship comes in, uh, puts anchor, and it is being checked by everyone, all the agencies, and this is um, what provides for corruption. But to go back to our legislative initiatives, uh, more or less, there is this balance um, in decision making. We must keep it. It could be improved, but we cannot uh, ruin it by taking away the um, license for, of local authorities because the community must have a say. I don't want to have a coal port next to my beach. I want it, my beach to be uh, focused on tourism because this will create more jobs because you know communities are interested not only in taxes, they are interested also in jobs. They're interested in giving their people jobs in, in tourism and attractive, attracting new people. Um, so if the community decides 
to be developing as a tourism destination, not a co-port, this is the right of the community. You cannot step on the community and build the co-port there. You must ask the people. You need to ask them the question, would you like to be sick of cancer uh, in 30 years' time? This is the dilemma. Um, you know, a port is like a, a body, a human body. You must have both the kidney and both of them and the liver. So both of them, you, all the rapid solutions um, are, are not efficient. We must provide against corruption. I'm not taking the case of rivers and lakes because there are quite a lot of lakes and, and rivers of local importance. And I'm absolutely positive it is up to the local community to decide whether they want to have a beach or the aqua park or the fishing facility. So cabinet of ministers has nothing to do with that. So first we must categorize those uh, objects. Then we must also uh, discuss the uh, existence of inland waters, uh, sweet water. And once again, this has nothing to do with uh, sea objects, marine objects, because uh, they are regulated by international law. National law here plays a very limited part. I apologize for taking such a long time to answer. Thank you very much for your detailed answer. And I think that you have pinpointed quite a lot of aspects connected to this topic and for development and other other opportunities uh, for the seaside. Uh, Ms. Bonder, you are working a lot with communities. In your opinion, uh, what is the mechanism for the communities to influence these um, poor development, or maybe this draft law um, should focus differently and should not be as comprehensive as it tries to be uh, in terms of uh, community development. Uh, Ms. Bonder uh, says that yes, really, uh, presently the uh, draft law takes the power away from communities and this must not be. And I would like here to say that everyone must do his or her own job Presently, the draft law means that the Marine Port Administration as a state enterprise uh, is actually assuming authority in terms of land use. And this looks very weird. In my opinion, uh, seaport administration must do strategical issues like the strategy of the uh, branch development of of sea transportation development. And um, maybe later there would be a network of seaports, river ports in Ukraine in the future. And this is the, the province, the, the license for this administration. And so it must also be discussed with the community when we are talking about land use. Um, and as soon as the decision is adopted about the profile of the port, what kind of a port is going to be developed there? So then the port planning must be presented to the Hromada, to the community, and uh, presented as a minimum and uh, taken, uh, incorporating the proposals from the community as maximum. So unfortunately, this is not the case now. But uh, we must remember that the port needs really the railway, the uh, a highway, and a lot of other sort of infrastructure. So actually, we are breeding a conflict between the local community and the port administration. So in my opinion, uh, this is a disbalance, the disbalance you have mentioned. And I believe that we must first discuss it with the stakeholders and find the natural place for everyone, incorporate the interests of everyone there in the draft law. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonder. Uh, Ms. Uh, Federi, you have the floor. Yes, just one comment, please. Uh, 
I am now uh, listening to the uh, members of the Transportation Committee defending local uh, self-governance. Imagine what is happening in our parliament if actually the head of the Committee on Organization of State Power Local Self-Government is taking a, uh, is adopting a draft law uh, actually taking the power away from the communities while the transportation community is defending the local community self-governance. And uh, Margot continues, I would like to ask a question to you, Ms. Frederick. You, you are a very proactive uh, member uh, of our political uh, milieu. And so the question is, why um, the head of the committee who should listen to the suggestions, not only from the communities, but all the uh, opinions of the profile ministries who were commenting on the uh, draft law. Why has she ignored all these comments? Um, so what should be the mechanism for the community to influence the decision-taken process? What can we do as the expert community? Because we have lots of specialists today in our audience. What can we do? How can we influence the process of adopting such decisions, uh, adopting such draft laws? What can we do? The question is uh, why Ms. Shulak is acting this way. I cannot answer for her, but I can suppose when once she managed, then she believes she can do it again. One year again uh, ago, we saw uh, that we were being kicked out of Zoom conferences, even when there were some uh, committees who were discussing digitalization, but they were unable to press a button to let us in uh, to participate in uh, meetings with international uh, partners. So, I mean, the situation was absurd because uh, people were, were getting like, 200 pages to read for the next day, but she managed and she got uh, this draft project adopted. So she believes she can do it again. And it means that one year ago, we were weak, we were not consolidated if we failed to stop her. Now we are stronger. And I think we can say thank you to Ms. Shulag because uh, problems consolidate us. and. Uh, give birth to leaders. So we are not, we were, we, we were hurt last year. For a year, we had to explain to our international partners how we're going to live on with that. But we didn't manage to stop it in the parliament. Then we stopped it in European parliament. So we managed finally, but it was really painful. And now we are in a better situation. We actually have international partners. We have Rosquid, uh, Urban Coalition for Ukraine. We have grown during this year. We have even committee for transportation who protect, defend local self-government. So we need to say that we can see the risks and we must express our gratitude to Ms. Shulak for making us the way we are and they will think whether to really vote for it because one year ago, when uh, 5655 was adopted, we lost by three votes. So we lost just by three votes. This time we must be stronger and we must, uh, uh, we must uh, return this draft law for finalization. We must fail it in the first reading because yes, I, men I mentioned the work group already. Yes, we must amend it and reshape it. Thank you, Ms. Federi, for your comment. I know that uh, Ms. Braddles has questions. Go ahead, please. Yeah, question, maybe a suggestion, actually, that, that was kind of given in, in the conversation, uh, listening to it. Uh, and it started with uh, Anna Bondar uh, explaining uh, her personal professional of, opinion as, a, as an urbanist and, and talking about uh, planning and how normally planning uh, process goes and how a regional plan 
could actually look like. And so my point is look like, and that is image. Uh, and that relates back also to what Van was showing uh, images. And I think in this whole conversation, we're talking about words and words and words and words, and it is not visual. And visual things are maybe more easy to grasp. So my suggestion would be to, to create a kind of presentation uh, that shows, first of all, maybe not only from Ukraine, but international situations like Van was showing, uh, which is so in the face, which is so clear and, and explains the dangers of like these kind of images can occur within this draft law, within the framework of this law, this easily can be done, this private developments at the, at the seaside or at, at the riverside or at the riverbanks or at the lakes. Uh, and that is, is a possibility. Another possibility is, uh, as Anna was, was uh, explaining, like how do you make a regional plan? How does it look like? I mean, a general audience, which is also part of parliament, uh, they are not used to that kind of plans. They don't see them regularly, they don't read them. So if you give some examples of one, let's say the bad side, this could happen as a possible danger, but also we could create this overall larger uh, plans uh, with our, our urbanists and, and our architects with indeed maybe as a suggestion from the audience was with um, uh, some international uh, input on, on other occasions, uh, how, how it happened in other countries. Uh, would that be a tool uh, that you could use in uh, uh, in Parliament, maybe as a presentation, but maybe also in in the in the media in in Ukraine? Maybe Anna, or yeah, maybe you, because you were the one instigating my idea. Thank you very much. This is a good suggestion. I think we're working with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Lilith, I, I also might add that national freight plans are very important, not only for the ports, but incorporating the rail, incorporating the highway, and also taking into account the types of cargo that are going to be handled. And so I definitely um, agree with what Ms. Flamenco is uh, saying uh, regarding uh, the need to really focus on the, the, the deep draft ports first and really focusing on that and how they tie into the land side connection, because you really only need one weak link in the chain. And that can be in the dock side, it could be in the land side. And so really trying to concentrate on saying, how do all those entities fit together and how can we plan for the cargoes that we'll be handling 20 years from now, not the cargoes that we handled 30 years ago, I think is very important. Sometimes the institutions that do the planning don't think about that future orientation of cargo and the different needs that it has depending on the characteristics of the cargo. So that would be very important to focus on as well. Ms. Federov, if, would that be something uh, that would, uh, uh, somehow in, in your, uh, when reaching out to the public domain, because that, that is your area of work, uh, would that be useful to have? And, and do you see potential there? Or? Absolutely. And I think that on our part, I and my colleagues uh, were working through all the aspects, including the corruption, ecology. Architects uh, could be added here because we're not experts in everything. So that is why this meeting is so important because it brings together experts from other uh, from different areas. And if we can get architects from other communities, because I was dealing only with ecology and corruption, maybe a little bit with court issues, I think we will get a very strong case 
and it will be even stronger with uh, such contributions. And this will allow us to explain to each representative of each community, of each committee, and it will be easy for us to explain why we are against it, because we need not only to be negative, but also to show the way to be positive. Marco, do you see in the Ukrainian Q&A line some questions that we might still raise? We have still about eight minutes to go, or are there things that we didn't bring up that, that one of the speakers might want to raise? Yes. I can see one uh, question in Ukrainian. We also can invite our audience to ask questions live. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, meanwhile, I'm asking the question from Ms. Olesia. Um, why, um, when uh, projects are being developed, uh, the rights of a person are not taken into account? Uh, because, um in term in times of war uh the right to take part in self-government um is not restricted presently so i can see the hand raised from miss olesia and maybe you can uh, expand your question and ask it to the expert you would like to choose excuse me just a second technical issues uh-huh You have the floor, Ms. Olesia, Ms. Dotsko. I am a proactive activist from Lviv in urban planning. My question is uh, the following. When such uh, projects are being developed, we have a national plan for the, develop, uh, for the protection of the rights of uh, people. And it should be the foundation for any uh, project that we develop. Uh, when we talk about the draft law 5655 uh, promoted by Ms. Shulak, um, I can say that in this sphere, in land use, in urban planning, the rights of a person have been infringed very heavily and uh, or actually eliminated. Because when such draft laws are being developed, there are no assessments there is no assessment how it would affect the safety of the people the security of the people and just a second i um you are talking yeah that was a technical issue and i am actually concerned uh, that when we are talking about new draft laws Quite often, we are not talking at all about human safety. During the war, human safety must be safety first, you know, this phrase. And um, very often, when I see draft laws, they do not mention this at all. When you write to the ombudsman, very often I have no answer. What would you suggest? Maybe I'm asking this question to our Ukrainian colleagues, MPs primarily. Maybe I will start, Ms. Bonder. You know, presently, I would like to explain the procedure of drafting laws. They do not need the some kind of concept which must be first discussed and then on the basis of this approved concept uh, agreed concept we are building on the draft law you know uh, so no we don't have this practice of uh, using the constitution and other laws as the foundation uh, only last year the uh, parliament has uh, has adopted the law on legislative activity and unfortunately it is going to start to, to be brought into effect after the end of the war and um, it spells that uh, the draft laws must start with a concept 
but uh, only then we will have um, this process um, this process uh, started in a more natural way with public consultations with the concept with this is discussion with the public and when this law finally comes into effect uh, then we will have this practice not yet now and i would like to add here definitely this must be the practice because we are uh, creating laws for people and so a uh, human focus uh, must be uh, our primary concern unfortunately it is my well my experience shows and it is my first term in parliament i see that the laws the draft laws which are submitted to parliament are some kind of fragments puzzle pieces which will never uh, make a whole picture maybe such draft laws do not need the underlying concept but if this is a law that is a foundation law for the whole sector it must definitely be discussed at the level of the idea then at the level of the concept and then at the level of the draft law I think these are the three, three stages that must be observed because some laws submitted are already stillborn at the stage of the idea or concept because the conflict with the effective laws. So we are wasting our energy on something that is stillborn quite often. Unfortunately, this is not the procedure now, but it is it looks very efficient but we have the procedure the practice of public hearing and we must uh, practice this in committees uh, public must discuss uh, each big fundamental draft law the assessment uh, of each law must be affected and it must assess its um, influence in in figures so it means that how costly it will be for the business for the state for the people and each draft law must have this table if this is a regulatory act this is all adopted as we have heard but unfortunately no one asks for it and none of the draft laws uh, submitted to parliament have this uh, expenditure table next to it so our legislative field is really close to Kosovo legislative field um, because no one thinks about the influence of, of such draft laws and how it is going to work in 20 years unfortunately we don't have this practice this practice uh, is there in in the British in British Parliament you cannot submit any draft law unless you have this calculation of the regulatory influence how much will it cost the country the business the citizens thank you very much uh, Ms. Uh, Olesa for your question Ms. Yulia Ms. Hanna thank you for your comments and I would like to give the floor to Mr. Georgi. You have the floor, your question. Good, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you very much for um, this opportunity to voice my opinion. The first question here I have to uh, the esteemed um, members of parliament do we have an opportunity to block this uh, draft law there is nothing to finalize there it must be rewritten and there is one more uh, factor here um, ecological factor how does this uh, law affecting nature and this is the fourth aspect uh, the assessment which must be done 
otherwise uh, very quickly we are destroying the environment thank you very much for your attention especially water resources which are i fully agree with you these are our key resources presently in ukraine thank you I would like to add one comment here. I think the experts uh, maybe know more, maybe can uh, give a comment. A few years ago, Ukraine had a huge problem with water resources, with water reserves, and with sweet water, drinkable water. And uh, today, the draft law we are discussing should be uh, viewed in terms of water reserves too, the water reserves we're keeping for future generations, at least for us to have drinkable water and technical water, because without this, we cannot speak of any development whatsoever. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Um, Natsakanyan, uh, because you are the expert, can you please take this question? I have already uh, mentioned uh, water to be the key strategical resource for Ukraine. And yes, we have uh, certain conclusions uh, by the uh, National Committee, uh, Line Committee for U um, Water Resources uh, and also special water use. And they have their regulatory policy. Presently, these plans for the development and management of water resources are being discussed. Because, yes, there are a lot of risks and the pollution is very uh, deplorable, uh, both anthropogenic pollution and uh, natural pollution. So we must take a comprehensive view upon the balance. What exactly can we count for to have in five years? What, what can we have in 10 years? let's say let's calculate it for well till 2050 uh, at least because if we take potential climate change issue and uh, globally and nationally our water resources are going to grow in value on the daily basis and the story goes here about the balance we can calculate to have in the future and what we need to do to eliminate this anthropogenic pollution or reduce it to a minimum, uh, especially uh, the pollution from the agricultural sector and uh, the Kahoka Reservoir disaster um, showed us, showcased how uh, vulnerable uh, this uh, resource is. Thank you. thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hrihori, for your question. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for your answers. I think we have a lot of comments in our chat and in our Q&A. But Lilith will voice one question from Mr. Travers. Uh, yeah, it is a question, but maybe also a suggestion. Uh, that uh, he says, I understand that uh, there are two different uh, focuses here and that uh, the remark that there was only 30% of this law actually dealing with, uh, with seaports and the rest with all kind of other waterways like uh, rivers and uh, lakes. Uh, he is suggesting, uh, why can't we suggest uh, as a first instant to um, just focus on the seaports first and leave out all the other uh, uh, sweet water uh, elements and deal with that let's say later uh, how, to, how to regulate those and maybe indeed as, as uh, Mrs. Klimengo was mentioning uh, that actually those parts should should be dealt with uh, regional or local authorities so would that be a suggestion to uh, to give to uh, to parliament uh, 
this Klimenko maybe. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. That is why actually I have submitted an alternative draft law concerning uh, exclusively seaports because our committee in 2020 has adopt, or adopted a very important sectoral uh, draft law uh, which concerned uh, river transportation, uh, rivers, lakes, transport, etc. Uh, everything that can be used logistically. This is one of the most ecological, cheapest way of transportation, I mean inland uh, waterways, uh, on the condition that they um, observe uh, ecological aspects and uh, do so with the participation of the com local communities. We have a lot of examples from the Danube and other rivers. And I say, really, these are two absolutely different foresight. Uh, the seaport development, uh, which is done by Ukraine on the uh, seashore, um, and the uh, inland water uh, development are two different foresight. So once again, sea, marine marine transportation, sea transportation is uh, regulated by the international law. So the, all we can do is simply apply to Ukraine. As for the inland waterways, even if these are artificial waterways, these are absolutely different. Uh, they are not subject to international law. Actually, we don't have any normal regulated legislation about uh, development uh, on inland uh, waterways for our country. Uh, and the uh, line legislation was actually adopted only in 2020, and not all bylaws were adopted that are necessary to it. That is why before that, imagine Ukraine had no law for 30 years before 2020 uh, that regulated inland water transportation and development. And it was, uh, that is why the uh, river banks were developed chaotically. Um, and river transportation is just a separate issue. You can say a lot here, but my major idea is the sea must be separated from inland water, water uh, objects. And if we uh, juxtapose these two concepts, um, we will never, ever untangle this. We will never reach a consensus. It's like comparing apples to oranges. These are just different trees. This is my idea. And that is why I have sub uh, submitted the alternative draft law. Ms. Fedorov? Uh, Pani... Uh... Thank you very much. Just a very short remark. Uh, Ms. Klemenko is a good uh, but very modest politician. She says she submitted this draft law and she says that it was failed uh, at, the, at the committee. I would like to emphasize here that when we are talking about the 30% of the sea transportation, it was discussed in the, by the Committee on Organization of State Power. Imagine that. It's not only about the procedure. It's, uh, it's, it's not only about the content, it's about the procedure. While we're discussing transportation issues uh, in the Committee on Self-Government, local self-government and uh, regional development, and if the head of this committee is using her position uh, as the head of the ruling party, to actually get this uh, law passed in her committee, not by the transportation committee. Anyone, any best possible politician can create the best possible draft law. Still, this is the vicious circle until we stick to the procedure, because there is the content and there is the procedure. And the procedure says this draft law must be discussed by the Transportation Committee, until we make the legislators stick to the procedure, we will never get to the point because we must cancel it. It's not efficient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fedorov. I think uh, here we must 
stop our discussion. We have a range of questions. Unfortunately, uh, our time is up. So I would like really to summarize. Today, I think we have agreed that this draft law must be declined, must be failed in the ballot, uh, and it must be rewritten, refined, but uh, actually, according to the procedure, it has already been submitted by the committee. And so let us hope that this public discussion with the experts, not only of the Transportation Committee, but also with architects, ecologists, and general public, this discussion will help us to be heard in the Parliament and this draft law will be revised and amended. Thank you very much, everyone, for your comments. And uh, the comments from the chat and Q&A uh, concerning the uh, proposal to uh, discuss specific aspects, we're going to collect all the comments and send them to Ms. Uh, Klimenko and Ms. Bonder. And I think they will help uh, our MPs in argumenting, uh, arguing their point in the uh, parliament. Thank you. Uh, Lilette, uh, maybe you have uh, something to say in conclusion? Yeah, just only a closing remark to to uh, thank all, all the ones present and also please to uh, to keep us up to date. Uh, see Rosfit also as, as a channel. Uh, so if if there are updates on it, please uh, keep us informed. There are many members of Rosfit are, are present also here. So we will uh, keep a close look at this and um, yeah, see whenever we can help out, uh, please reach out so so we can uh, help in, in creating it. Uh, a special thanks I also want to have once again to Olena Nefyodova. I think it's difficult for you to translate, but you still need to do it. <laughs> and what I mention again and again and again is that if you are talking in English, you are phrasing it as if you make up all the words yourself with the same commitment as the speaker does so thank you so much for this i think you're amazing thank you all for being present and uh, hope to see you in the next debate this one will be on youtube so you can also direct other people to it thank you until the next time thank you. And uh, you can see the recording on YouTube, and we are looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. See you soon.